The following production is part of the Play Some Video Games podcast network. Spartans, and welcome to Board with Video Games, the gaming podcast that strives for the right balance of coverage for games you play on your table and on your television. You can think of us as the John Lennon and Paul McCartney of gaming podcasts. We're a proud member of the PSVG Podcast Network and a member of the Make Us Better team over on Patreon. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle, and joining me on this co-op adventure, the only guy who never needed anybody's help in any way. Josh, how are you doing? Uh... Well, I need help from everyone all the time, so <laughs> that's not right. <laughs> and where's where's Ringo? Uh, but otherwise, um, I'm okay. Uh, everyone's sick at home. Me, the wife, the baby. Um, so other than that, we celebrated our fifth wedding anniversary on Friday. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I just hope that this thing passes quickly and efficiently. How are you doing? I am well. So would you say that at your home, you are down with the sickness? <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but yeah. <laughs> I, I talk about the Beatles, you know, in the intro, and then I want to keep it about classy music, so I go with Disturbed, right? I just watched kids react to Disturbed. Oh, really? Very interesting to see what the kids thought of. Have you? How did, how did the kids react to Disturbed? 90%. Did not look. <laughs> but okay. I didn't play um, Sound of Silence cover. I thought for sure you would, like, that's huge for them right now. So, like, I thought for sure they'd cover that. But they just that, featured all the screaming stuff. Yeah, that that is a pretty a pretty decent cover. Mm. Uh, I, I prefer the new cover. I, that's not by them, obviously, but the cover of Zombie. Mm, yep. That is very, very good. Um, what is the name of that band? I thought that was them. I thought it was Disturbed. It's not. That does zombies know is something wolves. Oh man, you can look it up. But anyway, okay. no, it's gonna bother me. So if you don't look it up, I will look it up. Something wolves. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. But I just thought it was really awesome that I go with, you know, talking about the Beatles at the beginning of the podcast and then right away, you know, transition to a, a band like Disturbed because I'm a huge Beatles fan. Like I really like the Beatles. If you were in our man, this might have even been the Slack chat days before Discord. I had to go in there and defend the Beatles against all of you hooligans about how good they were. The Beatles ever. The Beatles are incredible. I know. No, I mean, I shouldn't say you, like, as in you, but you as in the PSVG people. They were talking a lot. I defend around. myself, yeah. I'm so. defending myself against your blanket statement. <laughs> right. Bad <laughs> wolves? Bad wolves, yeah. Yeah, I got there. I was like, I know I'll get there eventually. Bad wolves. Speaking of Beatles, I don't know if I talked about it, but that James Corden, Paul McCartney thing they did was... One of the most incredible, fun, even emotional things I've seen on like network TV where they did the carpool karaoke, but went to like his house he grew up in in a pub and surprised people. Mm. That was incredible. Mm. Well, there's Paul McCartney, you know? Yeah. Hell yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, what I want to have given to be able to go see the Beatles live, though, I did really enjoy Beatles Rock Band. That game was fun. I always wish I bought it. It was just too much money when it came out. Yeah, it was very, very spendy. But, you know, it's one of those things. I really like the Beatles. So, yeah. Anyway, I'm sure people are sick of us hearing us talk about the Beatles. Really small other anecdote, very briefly. So when I was looking for um, some way to tie this back to the Beatles when I did the little intro, I was looking at, I was thinking of songs and lyrics and I was looking at trivia and all these things. And when I first started thinking of all the Beatles songs I like, in all the ways I could like use a little tag to connect it with you, I, I, I became very astutely aware, not that I didn't realize it before, but I hadn't really thought about it, how many Beatles songs are either about love or about drugs. And I feel like okay. there's... <laughs> so then I was trying to be like, well, I mean, I probably shouldn't be expressing love here, but I also probably shouldn't be encouraging drug use. So what other stuff could I potentially use to, to make this happen? So yeah, because my, my favorite Beatles songs actually... Little less known songs. I've just seen a face. Really enjoy that song. And while my guitar gently weeps, but both of those are, you know, very, very kind of like 
hey, I really like you. And it's like, not that I don't like you, but last time I've done things about calling you names of things, you got very uncomfortable. So I don't want to go down that road again. <laughs> I'm sure it was just, I was just acting it up. <laughs> right. But hey, this isn't a Beatles podcast. This is a gaming podcast. So thanks so much for joining us this week. As always, if you have any feedback, questions, suggested topics, hit us up at Board with VG on Twitter. Also over on Instagram, which Josh has been killing lately. Lots of pictures of awesome games over on the Instagram. So make sure you check that out. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash board with VG. Hopefully all of our information hasn't been stolen there, but who knows? It could have been. Also, if you want to communicate with us long form, you can hit us up with an email, boardwithvg at gmail.com. And as always, hashtag boardwithvg on all the social medias so we can keep track of all the awesome things you're talking about. If you're interested in helping make us better, check out patreon.com slash make us better. And a big thank you to all the supporters there. Thanks to the kindness of your heart, Board with Video Games will be getting its own podcast feed which should happen in the next week or so. So if you like listening to all of the PSVG proper shows, you can just maintain listening to the main PSVG feed. All of the shows will load there as they t- do right now. But if you're like, hey, you know what? Those, that Nintendo Shack, that's not that good of a show. Let's just, you know, subscribe to the OT. Let's subscribe to Board with Video Games. You can just do that on your own. And I promise I won't tell Donnie about abandoning the Nintendo Shack. I promise. But hey, that's enough housekeeping. Let's jump into some news. Josh, what has been some of the hot board game news over the last two weeks? What a great question. At first, I would like to say I support the Nintendo Shack. Just so I can get that right up in front. Don't (laughs) don't cancel Nintendo Shack. I I, Uh, I say that just because they have a lot of listeners. Just subscribe and don't listen. That's what I do. (laughs) They have a lot of listeners. That's why I say that. It makes my heart hurt a little bit. Not that it's not a great show. more listeners than us? Uh, I see the numbers. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, well, hey, Nintendo Shack listeners, listen to us. We talk about Nintendo every once in a while. That's why we have less listeners. <laughs> we don't talk about oh, Nintendo. No. Just on a positive light. Right, but, right. I know. Because, you know, they're doing, so, they're doing great work over there. They do excellent work over there, for sure. It is my go-to Nintendo podcast, and that's not because I'm biased. It's the only one I would ever listen to because it's Nintendo. Uh, okay. Here's our board game news. Uh, let's start with the winners were announced for the 2018 International Gamer Awards. Uh, we didn't cover it earlier in the year, but um, we'll go over this. Two categories. The winner in the multiplayer strategy game category was Rajas of the Ganges, designed by Marcus and Inca Brand, and published by Hutch. There's an exclamation mark in there. I hope I did that justice. Uh, the winner of the two-player general strategy game was Codenames Duet, designed by Vlad Shavatel and Scott Eaton. I am published by Czech Games Edition or CGE, if you're nasty. I do not believe we talked about these nominations when they happened in August, uh, which I prefaced at the beginning. Um, but if you look at the list of nominees... Kyle, does this surprise you? And would you like me to go over the nominees first? First of all, Vlada Chavadal. Come oh. on now. <laughs> He's a preeminent board game designer, and I understand his name is complicated, but as a Vlada Chavadal. I looked at all the stuff you had to talk about, and you gave me the hard one. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been on purpose, but uh-huh. I'm just saying... Vlada lot of Chivato. Okay. But yes, let's go over the nominees because I think it is interesting what if you go over the nominees, nominees and then look at who won. I think it's interesting. I do too, actually. So let me go over the nominees and you tell me, well, if it surprises you. So if we cover general strategy games in the multiplayer category, the nominees were Agra, uh, Altiplano, Azul, Clans of Caledonia, Decrypto, Gaia Project, Gentis, or is it Hentis or Gentis? I, I think know. it's Gentis, but I don't for certain. Gentis, uh, Heaven and Ale, Newsfjord, Pulsar 2849, Rajas of the Ganges, Santa Maria, and Transatlantic. So, well, I'll tell you, I'm shocked. <laughs> um, only because I've seen uh, Rajas of the Ganges before, but I've never really heard positive or negative about it. But all those other, almost all those other games in there are very well-known, very highly regarded games. Um, so I was very surprised to see them pull it out. So, I mean, it's good for them because it's now going to be on the list of people who want to play these award-winning games of 2018. 
Um, but what did you think? Were you surprised as well? Or? I was, because like you, this is a game I have heard of, but it is not a game that I have ever seen in a store, ever, you know, really been all that tuned into. So, you know, once I heard that at one, I took a look and it is ranked like number 252 on Board Game Geek overall. So it's clearly an excellent game. Just when you read off all of those games, though, or not maybe not all of them, but many of them, like Altiplano, Azul, Clans of Caledonia, The Crypto, Gaia Project, which is basically just that one other game. Oh my gosh. Terra Mystica, like a re-implementation of Terra Mystica, which is like a top 10 board game geek game. Um, Heaven and Ale. Like these games are games that people really like and have a lot of like strong... Uh, backing and support by so i was kind of surprised to hear that rogers of the ganjas is the game that came out on top like i don't i mean i probably would have picked six other games prior to that one winning yeah no i agree with you i mean I- i'm excited to try it now like it's it's basically um i you know obviously i can't play every game nominated so right when you you know you want to seek out winning winning games and could be great for for this game. Um, I'll, actually, what I probably do is look up like a Dice Tower um, review of the game. This is probably something I saw and skipped. Um, they might not have them, but usually, I, like they're pretty good at putting out stuff for all the games that come their way. Right. I do believe it got the seal of approval from the Dice Tower. Uh, well, that's big because so. they don't give that out too often. Right. So. Uh, all right. Go oh, yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do two player category games now? Yeah, so general strategy games, two-player category. The nominees were Codenames Duet, The Fox in the Forest, 13 Days, The Cuban Missile Crisis, Claim, Colonial Twilight, Fog of Love, and Shadows in Kyoto. So a number, again, not quite as many games, but a number of high-profile games there. But I think in this situation, Codenames Duet is one of those high-profile games. Um, surprising to you when you look at that or hear that list that uh, Codenames Duet was the winner? I wouldn't say surprising. It's definitely in, like, of the games I would consider winning, like Fox in the Forest, um, for me, like, is, uh, is high up there in my favorites. I've heard great things about Claim. Um, I've heard great things about Fog of Love. I have it. Um, <clears throat> but I'm also in a few Facebook um, board game groups. And recently, I'm not sure why. But people have started coming out kind of in negative light against Fog of Love. Um, really? Which is surprising to me because I've only ever heard good things. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people are saying it's um, it's not much of a board game. It's more like a romance simulator, and people aren't really high on that. At least, you know, the loudest voices are the people complaining. Okay. So, okay. so you know, it's really tough to say. I, I still think the game is very highly regarded. They're going to be back at PAX Unplugged with a Last year they were there and they just have a whole booth of just fog of love. And oh, wow. the same thing again this year. Like they have candles set up and they have tables set out and like they have people teaching you how, but they like create this like romantic atmosphere, which is bizarre at a gaming convention. Right. But if they can keep going to these conventions and just be talking about fog of love, that means they're being successful. Like, if they're not selling copies, they're not going to come back to the same convention a year later with possibly the same setup of just one game. Right. Because this is the only game that publisher does, right? It's just Fog of Love? It was their first game, and it's a, it was a Walmart exclusive. I'm not sure if it was a, um, a timed thing, but... It, as far as I know, I got it on Kickstarter, and you could only get it at Walmart otherwise. Gotcha. Interesting. I do remember that, and it looks like, yeah, when I just look up really quickly on Amazon, definitely cannot buy it. You can I still bet. want to play it and talk about it on the podcast. Um, it's just a matter of time where, like, we're feeling ready to sit down, and, like, it's definitely looks like it's going to be a little bit heavier than what we typically sit down with at 8 o'clock on a Saturday night. Right. Actually, take that back. You can buy Fog of Love right now on Amazon from one seller for $194. Nice. So if you really want it, I mean, I plus it. plus $7.49 shipping. So if you have an extra $200, uh, you can buy Fog of Love right now on Amazon. So there That's you go. It's a shipping cost. It's a heavy box. So they're, they're actually paying <laughs> on that end. <laughs> 
<laughs> and maybe you can get it somewhere else for far less than that. I'm just saying, <laughs> right on Amazon. That is your only option if that's where you're looking. So okay, um, yeah. You, did you want to talk about what you thought about the general strategy game? How did you feel? Have you played Codenames Do it? Um, I have it. I haven't played it, but I own it. Um, I think honestly, just looking at the list, I think if I were forced to pick one, Codenames Do it is probably what I would pick. Um, obviously we've talked about the Fox and the Force on this show. We have a lot of love for that game on this show, even though my significant other does not have a lot of love for it. I have a lot of love for it. Um, so right now, like obviously of the games on here, that's probably what I would pick, but I'm not surprised at all that Codenames Duet won that, um, category from what I hear from what people tell me, it seems like Codenames Duet might be the best version of Codenames. I would agree with that. That's probably the best version of Codenames. So, absolutely. Cool. Anything else about the awards you want to talk about or think is important that we cover? I don't think so. We can move right on to the next topic if you want. Yeah, why don't you talk more about a failed Kickstarter that's probably coming back as another Kickstarter. (laughs) Let's do it. It's You know, this is one that um, I dodged a bullet on. This project is near and dear to my heart. Uh, as far as the IP goes, um, so while the world, uh, while the board gaming world hasn't, uh, sorry, has many Kickstarter success stories, there are a few disasters as well. One of those is Evil Dead Two, the official board game, which raised uh, an astounding uh, over seven hundred thousand dollars back in twenty sixteen, uh, and in May twenty eighteen, Space Goat Productions. Uh, the Kickstarter sponsor officially announced the game would not be coming out. It is now looking like Jasco Games, who I need to look up what they make. I have their link open. Uh, might be resurrecting the game and, unsurprisingly, bringing it back to Kickstarter. Uh, on the plus side, for every game backed, they plan to provide one to a backer of the previous Kickstarter. So it's like Lisa Mattresses. You buy a mattress, they donate a mattress. It's great. <laughs> not a sponsor. Right? Did I freeze? Did you freeze? <laughs> you froze. And I purposely didn't talk because then the when I edit, it just cuts it out automatically. <laughs> okay. I was talking just in case it was important to talk. Nope. So when, when, I, you talk about, when you talked about Lisa Mattresses, that's when it cut out. Oh, perfect. I said not a sponsor. <laughs> so hopefully that got in there. Uh, and so this, brings up, uh, this obviously brings up a lot of other questions, um, but at least they're trying to help, right? Kyle? I mean, it is nice that they're trying to help. That's that's a good thing. Um, Jasco has done a lot of um, branded, I should say, I, I, a lot of board games in relation to IPs. Oh, um, so, I see it right there. Yeah. yeah, so they've okay. done a lot, of, a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, so that's kind of where their um, specialties lie, if you would. So basically what the setup seems to be is that this game is going to go back to Kickstarter. And if they reach their funding goal for every individual who backs the Kickstarter, one game will be sent to someone who backed the original Kickstarter. But my que- I have a lot of questions about this. Like, I appreciate the effort they're putting into this. I think this is good. But is the funding goal the same level as the original? As in, like, they're trying to get to the same, like, $700,000 level or the same number of backers? Because what if they reach the funding goal but only get to the half number, half the number of backers? Do, like, half the original backers just not get a game then? Well, there's even, there's even a crazier part to this story is they don't have the license to do the exact same game that was originally kickstarted. They have some components from the first game. So they have to, like try to be their own company and make a game they're proud of because what right. if space goat wasn't making a quality game also which it doesn't sound like they were it right it sounds like they were taking seven hundred thousand dollars and running <laughs> well uh, i think the company like went out of business went out of yeah. business so well, yeah, who knows if they were going on like vacations or if they were like the bank companies before <laughs> the buyouts like they're like hey we just went to jamaica for a month before we started making Evil Dead 2, the board game. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna hope I'm gonna assume they were trying very hard to make it work. I hope so. It just didn't work out. I hope so. Um it it also leads me to another like one of the reasons, not the main reason, that I stopped backing the um Horizon Zero Dawn game was because of Steamworks games reputations 
for not following through with the projects or having them be severely delayed by years. So right. everyone in the comment section for Horizon Zero Dawn, they're like, yeah, this, is, this is great, but I'm still waiting for what you promised me two years ago. And, and they said, well, we don't even have the rights to this game yet either, but we'll get them before the game comes out. So it, it, this enters the wishy-washy world of Kickstarter where people are able to post projects um, that aren't even necessarily truthful in what they're stating as, I, we don't like, they're, they're, they're being truthful because they're saying it, but when you look at a Kickstarter that's like the Horizons are done, it should say, pending rights right on the front not on like right. the fifth paragraph of the last chapter i think that game is pretty safe uh considering the playstation blog like had it right, on right. The, official, the official playstation blog did it like a little like new in stores and it talked about how or doing their store or their gear store and it plugged the kickstarter for the game so i feel like that one will probably be okay but you are right it is interesting when their answer, like in, you know, there's the um, Hunger Games game yes. that is on Kickstarter right now. And like one of the first questions is, and it's interesting how they answer it. And you might want to look it up while I'm talking about it. But they say something to the effect of that they have been working hand in hand and they have been given permission to print the game. They never actually say they have the rights to it. They never say like, oh, yes, we've paid for or have acquired the rights to publish this game. It's something where they without saying they have the rights they're like well we've been talking to them and they said it was okay so that's interesting yeah and like i said if you're looking it up i don't know but i I feel like when i read it i was like okay maybe they are going to maybe there's some agreement that if the funding happens then they'll purchase the rights so that's kind of where the oh yeah it's fine if the funding happens then we actually pay for it but we haven't paid for anything yet yeah i I, the first comment that at least is in the comments is not, there's no like questions popping up here, but um, they also did the Pacific Rim game. Right. So. And you backed the Pacific Rim game, right? I did, I was backing it, but I, I, because they did that all in pledge for like $500 or whatever, I couldn't. It was another game where I would I would rather have all of it than none like than none of, than just half of it. So I just couldn't afford to it. But I did find the question. It, it's um, <clears throat> so they asked, "How did you manage to obtain the rights for Hunger Games?" Uh, but I, I don't see an answer from them. Um, no worries about licensing rights. Everything is fully licensed with Lionsgate, and on top of that, the game is fully approved. That's what the creator said. Oh, okay, yeah, it does say this project is officially licensed by Lionsgate, who released the Hunger Games movies based on works of Susan Collins. We worked side by side with Lionsgate for a long time to produce this game and it has been approved by both Lionsgate and Susan Collins agents for us to release. But like, so this guy, Michael, uh, last name omitted, this was his question. And it's a good question. So he says, how did you manage to obtain the rights for Hunger Games? I don't recall seeing any announcement about this. After the Dr. Horrible situation, I'm concerned this is a repeat. Additionally, the complete lack of reviews from anyone makes me pretty wary. That is... A legitimate concern um but that's the kickstarter thing right we talked about it before we talk about it almost all the time when you mention kickstarter mm-hmm. it's a risky investment <clears throat> well it can be a risky investment it isn't always a risky investment um if you want like i watch board game blunder it's a dice tower show every tuesday morning where they go over like a bunch of board game news and they, they changed people who host the kickstarter corner um, it used to be Mandy, and mm-hmm. now it's uh, no. It used to be Suzanne, sorry. Right. And now it's a new girl that who I wasn't familiar with, but she has like a YouTube um, Kickstarter segment that she does, and she says like in it, which I like. She'll tell you if it's a first time um, creator, and if it is, she says expect delays. Right. This is a first time creator. They don't know the pitfalls of Kickstarter yet. They don't know what it's going to be like around holidays, Chinese New Year, all these things that stop shipments hurricanes tsunamis right everything like so i like that she says expect delays and that's kind of part of the story obviously it doesn't cover what happened with space goat right but it's just another i know space goat isn't the biggest failure in, in kickstarter Not i'm at trying all. to remember that video game that was like a colossal failure with like a million dollars or something like that or more. 
Um, but I mean, it's in, it's it's things for me because Evil Dead Two is such a an awesome property, and I'm such a big fan of it. And we don't have a lot of horror games out there. This is a handful, right? But I think the more you get into the hobby, the more people you're introducing, and this obviously is going to turn people off. But it also brings us to the thing where our game, like Kickstarters, allow any game to be made, essentially. Right. So are we not going to see games like Evil Dead 2 ever being made outside of Kickstarter because people don't want to touch IPs like that? Right. It is interesting, too, because I wonder, okay, you had the first game had a little over 6,000 backers. How big is the audience for Evil Dead, an Evil Dead 2 board game? Was that 6,000 backers, 75% of the audience, 80% of the audience, 5% of the audience? And if you are one of those 6,000 backers, are you going to back this game at all? Like, is there what percentage of those 6,000 are going to say, hey, I'm going to put my hard-earned money up one more time to see if I can get a copy of this game potentially again? Or are those 6,000 backers going to be like, no, I tried this once. I am going to wait for 6,000 other people to back this game in hopes then that maybe I get my copy. Like, I really wonder what that breakdown is going to be and how that is going to work, you know? It's, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to put into context the amount of backers. I don't think anyone who backed it previously, unless they want two copies of the game, are going to back it again. And, like, at this point, if you've put in $200 to a game that was never made and was canceled... Why would you ever, even right. even if it was like Universal Studios' new board game company, why would you put money into something that that's like that? So, like, <clears throat> I'm trying to find a game that I've backed that has, like... A lot of backers? A lot of backers. Fireball Hunger Island. Game, Hunger Games game, it's fully backed, 293 backers. They need 6,000. <laughs> and if... Each copy is supplying another game to another person. How much? Yeah, you're right with your question earlier. Like, how much are they going to ask for this game? Because they can't take this money and go in the red. Like, they pick up an IP and go in the red on a board game. Right. Now, as an example, you know, and actually speaking of games that have been featured on the Dice Tower recently, this was played today on the Dice Tower. uh, Fireball Island Hmm. has 23,000 backers. That's a lot of backers. So is Fireball <laughs> Island more or less popular than the Evil Dead 2? Uh, they both have nostalgia. I don't like <laughs> I probably guess Fireball Island's more famous in the board gaming industry, at least. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, and that, you know, the, I think the, man, it's kind of embarrassing. I think I paid 130 bucks for Fireball Island because I got it with the expansion. So I think it was like mm-hmm. 130 bucks or something like that. I need to come to your house to play it. What's that? (laughs) I need to come to your house so I can play it. It's currently on a boat. (laughs) Uh, That is one of my favorite things as a very quick aside. When the Kickstarter companies, when they send you like, here's the boat that's going to the United States with the games (laughs) and you can like track the boat. And then you realize that that must be a really boring month on the ocean because it takes them a really long time to get the port. Uh, And then you understand why games sometimes are expensive to ship from China. So, Yeah. yeah. But... So do you think, if you had to predict or guess, do you think that this Evil Two, Evil Dead 2, the official board game, when this is revived and comes back to Kickstarter, mm-hmm. do you predict this game will get funded? I like I, uh, I like to think that like out of the goodness of the internet and board game people, that it will. But then again, I, I thought that, I um, can't remember the name of the company now, which is telling. Uh, the game, the board game company that I helped try to save by buying Backyard Treehouse Builder, and that and they didn't need that much money, and I thought I helped save them, and the internet kind of came to help, but not Is that really. Crash Games? It might have, uh, maybe was it Crash Games? I think it might have been Crash Games. Um, but the internet did not come to help them save a whole studio, so maybe it won't come back to save one game. Uh, but if it's if Evil Dead to the board game is affordable. I would consider backing it, knowing that someone else would be getting a game when I backed mine. That's a nice little bonus. It's definitely a situation where I would be more likely to back this game, knowing that it is going to help someone else. Right. However, I don't know if this is a like I like the Evil Dead. Like I think it's I maybe like it less than other people. I think it's fine. 
but I don't, I'd be very nervous basically looking at the other properties and the other games that this company has made. If this is a game I would be excited about, because it's a property that I'm wishy-washy on. And if I love the IP, maybe I'm more okay with a game that I'm not as stoked about. But if I am fine with the IP and the game is fine, I'm probably a lot less (laughs) likely to want to back it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there's no reason to back a game that you're not going to want to play. Right. You're not interested. So. Even if it helps other people out. We're not all rich. If I was rich, sure, I'd buy 6,000 copies of the game. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Exactly. Then it'd be totally (laughs) found. So, um, yeah, it was Crash Games. Okay. They are now defunct. Some peace. <laughs> yeah, they are now defunct. Cool. All right. But hey, so let's move on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and next... I was say it has it, it has been a very and I know every year is busy when it comes to Kickstarters, but I feel like it's been a really busy Kickstarter fall. Yeah, it really has. So we might get yeah. more coming. I know, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and people are probably wondering if you're big into board games. We haven't really talked about Essen at all. And uh, we'll be talking about Essen next week. So similar to our Gen Con sh- preview show that we did, um, next week we'll be talking about Essen Spiel um, and the games that we are looking forward to that are going to be there, the games that we think you should check out if you live in Germany or are going to Germany and, and want to check out all the things there. Um, when I last looked earlier today, the board, the geek list on Board Game Geek with all the games that were going to be at Essen Spiel was over a 1,000 games at this point. So... There's a lot of stuff for us to sift through and go through to make sure we get a very comprehensive, clear look at all the games that we're, we're very interested in. So be on the lookout for that next week as Josh and I just read Board Game Geek for the next week. <laughs> but while I'm not reading Board Game Geek, you know what I'm going to be doing, Josh? Mm, is it mastering your Paul McCartney impression? It is not mastering my Paul McCartney mm. impression. It is thinking about the news that we got this week that it might finally be happening josh <laughs> it might be happening it's so, definitely happening <laughs> well i think I, I do think it is definitely happening i was trying to get my hopes up so mm-hmm. in the world of video games news yes this story is a little old it's from last week but we only cover news every other week so you get it now are we finally getting the harry potter RP- rpg that i and many other people have asked for leak footage made its way onto reddit last week from the user vape this bro Oh, Reddit, never change, never change, Reddit. Who says they were approached for market research to watch a trailer in a shopping mall. And of course, being the responsible person they are, they recorded it, posted it to the internet. Folks in the games media have subsequently confirmed with sources that it seems like this game is real. Uh, It is tentatively called Harry Potter Magic Awakened, though there are other names that have been thrown around. And it seems like it is likely being developed by Avalanche Software, that's not the Just Cause Avalanche. That's the Disney Infinity Avalanche. So early indications and a lot of feedback seems to be that the game that showed, which is very clearly seems to be an open world RPG, happening in the world of Hogwarts with um, custom character creators, um, a lot of spells going on, finding some fantastic beasts and all of these things. You know, speculation is that this was a rough cut of a tr- the announcement trailer. So that's what people seem to think is that they were trying to demo out different uh, announcement trailers, and that's part what this person saw was one of the potentials um, that was going to happen. So, seems like maybe if they're to the point of putting together trailers, if that's actually what this was, we might be getting an announcement sooner rather than later. So, Josh, are you as stoked about this game as I am? Well, not as much as you are, but (laughs) I do... It is exciting... I showed it to my wife like right away as soon as that info <clears throat> leaked out. Um, if that's like in-game engine, mm-hmm. then it looks stunning. It looks great even on a crappy recorded like right. camera from a monitor. Um, especially like the character creation. Um, it looks like like a third person, almost like Tomb Raider style, like of controlling. Um, um, who knows? Maybe this will be uh, launched at uh, EXO 2018, and we'll find out it's a Microsoft exclusive. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> I don't think that will happen, but today Discord was going crazy about what studios are Microsoft's going to acquire. 
Yeah. Maybe they'll buy Avalanche. <laughs> maybe. Well, Avalanche was purchased by WB. So maybe they'll buy WB. <laughs> so maybe they'll buy WB. Um, yeah. For those of you who don't know, there's rumors out there that obviously Microsoft's going to try to obtain Obsidian, which would be an interesting pickup for them. But yeah, I'm really interested in this game. As I've talked about on the show more than one time, I am really, I, I have a hankering for a really deep Harry Potter RPG. And the thing I think and this is not an original thought to me. Um, this was, I heard this uh, from uh, the folks over at Game Informer, but I think I do fall into this because I think they said it in a way I had never thought of it before, that the worst part about Harry Potter is Harry Potter. Like the world is amazing, but Harry Potter kind of stinks as a character. <laughs> and once they said that, I was like, holy crap, they're totally right. <laughs> like, I really don't like Harry Potter that much at all. I like everything else about Harry, the, the the book series, the movies. I like all that other stuff. I really don't like Harry Potter that much. You're a crazy so, person. Neville lover. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Number one, I'm not talking about Neville. Number two, what? Are you saying Harry Potter's great? He's a great character. What's He's great human. about Harry Potter? He's a human. He has human emotions. He's a wizard. I know he is. You're a he wizard, has, Harry. He, I know he is, but he, he has flaws. And yes... While he got people in trouble a lot, he was always trying to do the right thing, and he was an orphan boy who missed his parents. It's not his fault. It's the people who raised him. That's their fault. Okay. He lived, that... under, us. He lived under stairs for his whole life. Get, get a break. Well, that doesn't... <laughs> That's how she created to create the character. That's what make him a I'm good character. Defending Harry Potter. <laughs> I, you, and you're welcome to defend Harry Potter. I just think there are far better characters in that universe than Harry Potter. <laughs> Harry okay, Potter is yeah. one of the least cool characters in that whole universe. Uh, so, but anyway, sense. I mean, he's still better than Ron. So we'll we'll go with that. Okay. <laughs> you think Ron's better than Harry Potter? No, clearly I don't, but you make Ron sound like rubbish. Ron is rubbish. What does Ron, Ron ever do? Ron lands Hermione. He's better than us all. Which, which J.K. <laughs> Rowling has said was a mistake, that she shouldn't have done that. Yeah, okay, so even well. she knows how wrong that is. But outside <laughs> of that, what does Ron ever do that's worthwhile? Listen, this isn't a Harry Potter podcast. <laughs> it's because you don't want to answer my question because you know there's no good answer because Ron's worthless. She anyway... Cast- she cast Johnny Depp in Fantastic Beasts and it's not holding back. She doesn't know what she's talking about anymore. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm really excited for this game. I think the cool part is the rumors also say that the game probably takes place in the 1800s, which I think getting in front of and before all of that stuff, before Fantastic Beasts, before Harry Potter, I think is really cool because it's going to allow them to tell a neat story. I think it would have been even cooler if they would have gone all the way back to the beginning and talked mm-hmm. about the fo- founding of Hogwarts. Like if that had been the game and then you picked to be one of the founders, like that would have been a cool game, I think. But I will take this. I will create an awesome win- wizard. I will go to the proper house for me, which is Hufflepuff because mm-hmm. Hufflepuff is the best. I know, right? I'm the worst. Anyway, I'm really excited about this I game. I- I'm just giving you credit. Okay. <laughs> I'm really excited about this game. I can't wait to hear more about it. If I hear more about it and I like it, it probably might become my most anticipated game if they say all the right things and it doesn't actually isn't like some really like weird, good looking mobile game or something. Oh, God, I hope not. (laughs) So, yeah, next story. And this is one that's very Sony centric. But you know what? Every once in a while, we can do things like that. I'm a massive fan of Horizon Zero Dawn. So some recent hires at Gorilla have me wondering what Gorilla is planning. The folks over at Push Square have reported that Simon LaRoche has returned to Gorilla. He was there for Killzone 2 as a game director, but he most recent, or excuse me, he was hired as a game director, but most recently he worked as the game director over at Ubisoft on Rainbow Six Siege. And they have also brought on Chris Lee as a principal game designer who also worked on Rainbow Six Siege. So, Josh, I know your love for Horizon Zero Dawn also runs very deep. Mm-hmm. Does this mean Horizon Zero Dawn 2 is going to have multiplayer? Is it going to have Battle Royale? Is it going to have tactical breaching combat where you have to save uh, or defuse a bomb? Is Killzone coming back? Are they making some other game completely? What's happening? I, I'm i pretty sure that they have already been working on Horizon Zero Dawn, the sequel. 
So I don't think this is for Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, you're, you, you might not be uh, crazy um, with your battle royale guess, though, because uh, who knows what we're going to get with the next kill zone. Uh, but yeah, I think it's going to be a new kill zone uh, just because of who they're bringing on. And it seems to like mesh well together. I really would trust anyone who worked on Rainbow Six Siege just because you see how they can create um, what you, I would call like Overwatch levels of replayability. Mm-hmm. where it's a game that I think that everyone is going to be trying to do games like Ghost Recon Wildlands, Rainbow Six Siege, Overwatch now. Overwatch just sells $60 if you don't yeah. get it on a sale week. That says, and so, and so is Siege, uh, and I think so is Wildlands now that they're in Season 2. So I think it's just great to see Gorilla doing another game. Like, we know Gorilla's IPs. Maybe it's a brand new one. Maybe it's not even Killzone. But so... Sony announced today on Tuesday that they are acknowledging that they are working on the next generation console for PlayStation. So I wonder if it could even be a game that's five years out. Well, and it's interesting too, because I think we'll kind of tie this in. This isn't specifically the thing. Did you see the other Call of Duty news that had people speculating? Yeah, I was chatting about it today. Yeah, so basically there's a job listing for whoever's next. Sledgehammer, I can't remember who's next in the Call of Duty rotation. Uh, but whatever studio theoretically would be publishing their game next year was hiring for a game that they didn't na- la- name the game, obviously, but they said it was for next generation consoles, which then mm-hmm. led the speculation to, okay, Sony confirms they're working on the next, a new console. They didn't technically say it, a PlayStation 5, but a new console or that a new generation is inevitable. You know, and then there's this job listing. Is PS5 coming out in 2019? No. Right, no. <laughs> no. I just like the, the no. No, no but, but they probably have dev kits out. They, they might have dev kits out by 2019. Right. So well, and it would, will need the people for that. And it would surprise me even if maybe Naughty Dog has something early now because they do a lot of their development with them down there. So it's very possible that even Naughty Dog would have one already. Well, I mean, you're Sony, right? Microsoft's kind of coming back. They're not being competitive sales numbers wise, but they're kind of showing signs of putting up a fight. So if you're Sony, what do you want to launch your new console with? Every one of your exclusive titles, Spider-Man 2, um, another Uncharted, Killzone and Horizon Zero Dawn, like Last of Us 2, whatever, like whatever they can push out, they need to crush that lineup and... I think that if you can start doing that now, why not? Yeah. So what you're saying is you think that Horizon Zero Dawn 2 will not have multiplayer. It's going to be another single-player RPG like the first, and that these two are working on Killzone or something completely different from Horizon. Yes, that's what I am uh, hoping. (laughs) I hope that they don't put multiplayer in Horizon Zero Dawn 2, unless unless it's a cooperative multiplayer not like story based. Not no. I don't need um, like uncharted multiplayer. Like I don't need to be doing team deathmatch in Horizon Zero Dawn. Did you play the Horizon, the uncharted multiplayer ever? I yeah. It's kind of fun actually. I mean, it's not I, great, but it's not. It's better than I thought it would be. It was. I wasn't a big fan of it, I, but I had no expectations. So oh okay. I just didn't enjoy it. <laughs> what if they did? you know, pulling off or thinking about this Rainbow Six Siege thing. What if they do mm-hmm. Horizon Zero Dawn multiplayer, mm-hmm. but it's like a 4v4, like, tactical, like, we're trying to enter a village and you are trying to defend a village or something like that? I mean, so I was totally opposed to Mass Effect multiplayer and it ended up being one of my favorite multiplayer experiences. I never finished Mass Effect 3, the story of the game, because I played the multiplayer all the time. Are every really? time I went, every time I went in to play the game, I'm like, nah, I'm just gonna play multiplayer because I really? loved it. Mass Effect Three multiplayer was amazing. But when you told me, <clears throat> when I was told that multiplayer was coming to Mass Effect, it didn't seem to fit. So mm-hmm. you know, they could change my mind with Horizon, but I just don't need that if it's there and it's not taking away from main game production. That's fine for the people who would play it. I just worry when you start adding multiplayer to games, how much that takes away from game development. Uh, yeah. For the story, like the multiplayer in the Tomb Raider reboots, exactly. That was that was a little rough in the was it in the first and second one or just the first one? Just the first one, I think. Yeah, that was that was a little rough. Uh, okay, so with that being said, then 
Would you do you think Killzone has enough cachet? Do people care if there's a new Killzone, or do you think this is going to be a new IP? No, I mean Killzone does like name a name Sony's first person shooter. Do they need one? They don't have one. Yeah, of course they need one. Why do they need one? You can't just never... on Call of Duty. What's that? You can't just rely on Call of Duty. They need to be competitive too. Just because they're winning doesn't mean they should just kind of chill out complacent. Right, but I'm just saying, it, does it make sense for them to make another kill zone? Or if they're going to make a first person shooter, should it be not tied to kill zone? Like oh, they had oh, kill zone, oh. they had resistance. They like neither of those, I mean, maybe they sold okay, but neither of them seemed to have like the exact pull that place that, that Sony was hoping for. Sure. So does it make sense to make a new kill zone or does it make sense to make something completely different, a new I mean, IP that is a shooter? New IPs are always good. And if it's a shooter, yeah, that's a bonus with the, the people you have developing the game. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I was just thinking of on the lines of the only shooter you would see on Sony was kill zone. <laughs> so it's obviously possible that it could be a different <laughs> IP for a shooter. Um, so I guess it would just depend on, I mean, they have a game director, but it would depend on the developer, whoever they have working on it. Right. So it'll be interesting to see. We probably won't know the answer to this for a couple of years still. Hmm. Um, but I think, yeah, you know, if you're a PlayStation right now and if you're aiming for, let's say, 2020 for the PlayStation 5, I think, you know, launching with Horizon Zero Dawn 2 wouldn't be the worst move ever. Right. You know, that is definitely something that probably would be helpful for them because you got to imagine that, you know, between Dreams, uh, Days Gone, Unchar- Uncharted, <laughs> uh, Last of Us Part Two, and Ghost of Tsushima, and Death Stranding. I mean, Death Stranding could potentially be a bridge game. Um, but between that, like, those pretty much lead you into, through 2019, into early 2020. So then launching with something big like a Horizon Zero Dawn 2, maybe that new studio in San Diego is working on... <laughs> Um, Uncharted, a new Uncharted series, like it's been rumored, you know, something there to launch in fall of 2020. It seems totally plausible. So, Mm -hmm. all right. So, hey, that's some of the fun news for the week. On to our topic of the show, which for this week, at least, since next week is going to be very board game focused, this topic of the show, a little bit video game focused. The all streaming future seems to be close at hand. Hand. Folks are currently playing AC Odyssey in Chrome as a test for Google's Project Stream. This includes PSVG's own Donnie at Play in Nintendo, who has 45 minutes of gameplay up on YouTube. Uh, Microsoft has announced Project X Cloud, aiming to bring game streaming to PC, consoles, and smartphones, with technical test planning to start next year. And PlayStation has PlayStation Now, which a lot of people have been really critical of when it launched because it was pretty expensive. But, yeah, it's still, I mean, like, my big thing is I got it for $40 for a year when I got it. So I didn't think it was expensive at all. (laughs) But anyway, uh, I use it, you know, and I still use it from time to time. My year runs up next month. Um, And I use it from time to time. And like, I've had no latency issues at all. I've never run into any streaming problems. I've never run into an ability to not connect. Like I really haven't had any problems. So Josh, how close are we to the Netflix of gaming where we no longer own anything and all of our games are through subscription. Everything is streaming. How close are we to that? Is that, are we a generation away? Two generations away? When does that happen? We're there. We're at the doorstep. Uh, I also am doing um, Project Steam, stream, (laughs) Steam. (laughs) I'm also playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey on my computer. Um, Oh, I didn't realize you had gotten in. I got in. I was actually playing right before we we record. uh, Okay. Tonight. Um, It's really bizarre. It just loads right up on Chrome. Like, simple as that. You don't have have any applications open. I have to keep going back to my email that has the the link in it. But... (laughs) um, yeah, you just pop right in, seamless. Uh, it even pops up with an alert that says, like, if your internet signal is getting too low. Mm-hmm. That doesn't kill the game, though. It just um, de-reses it a little bit. Okay. Um, it's a word I'm making up. Uh, it lowers the resolution just a little bit. Um, I know what you meant. It will go back once your connection is stable. Uh, obviously, if you can hardwire your computer. Mine isn't, so I'm running it off Wi-Fi. Uh, and I'll tell you what. It is jaw-dropping how great the game looks streaming through a web browser. Mm. Uh, It's not Xbox One X. uh, It's not PS4 Pro. But you can still tell 
how much work they put into like the facial animations, uh, when when you get in the landscape view, everything. Uh, it still looks incredible. So um, if I did watch a little bit of Donnie's stream too to see how his experience was. And then I'm going to try it on a laptop and I'm going to see if the experience is similar. I don't run a high-end PC. My desktop is very low-end. Um, but yeah, it's a sign. Like <clears throat> This is what Microsoft tried to do with the Xbox One originally, and just people weren't ready for it. Right. The country wasn't ready for it. The internet infrastructure was not ready for it. And I would argue it's still not ready for it mm -hmm. for most people. Um, and I think that's why a lot of most people are hesitant to um, get excited about the project stream or uh, Microsoft's X Cloud because people aren't getting the differences between like me and you and what we get for Wi Fi and what we pay and the signal strength we get are astounding and it should, it should be universal. Every other country in the world that has good Wi Fi, has good internet, it's the same in that whole country. Capitalism, baby. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it, you know, so I think the, the only thing that's slowing down the future of gaming is the future of government and politics, which stinks. Would you prefer to just stream your games? <clears throat> so I am a collector. So physical media is important to me. Mm -hmm. But recently, especially with game sharing, um, I've been able to let go of the video game side of that. Uh, it still feels weird. I'm still, I still have like moderate anxiety over losing things. Um, but really when it comes down to it, I think I'll have bigger things to worry about if we get to a point where everyone loses all their game data. I think that there might be more things going on in the world at that time where losing my video games would be the least of my worries. At least I hope. <laughs> Do you think that there will, at least for the foreseeable future, for the next few years, you know, PlayStation has said, obviously, like we talked about earlier, they're working on their next console. Obviously, Microsoft has said they're working on their next console. Do you think that's the last, like, true generation of consoles we get? And after that, it just moves to a streaming stick or a small box with no drive or maybe just your television, depending on where we're at when we get to those points is, is this upcoming console generation, the last true console generation we're going to have. You know, uh, I'm curious, like my fire TV has a gaming channel and you can like get a fire con TV controller, like a mm -hmm. game pad. I'm curious what the amount of people who do that are and what quality of games are coming through that. Um, more besides like crossy road and some, some, uh, there was recently, <laughs> um, was it on, I think it was on Reddit, maybe Reset Era, one of the two, um, where there was leaked footage of the MMO that Amazon's Game Studio was working on that really? made it online. And it got removed like instantly, <laughs> like really, really quickly. But I mean, there's there's something there coming in the future, apparently. I mean, that's great. Um, I don't, here's the problem, right? So you're Microsoft. <laughs> Uh, are you willing to risk what happened uh, when you announced the Xbox One to happen again? You're Sony. Do you want, you know, are you afraid to jump into that um, kiddie pool with Microsoft and see how it is? You, I don't think you can truly do a um, only cloud console because of the player base. People are so hesitant and resistant to change that I think they could do a hybrid, like it's both. Mm -hmm. But and then you do like the switch tax where you have to pay more for a physical game. And then maybe that like leads into the next generation. So like Microsoft um, comes out with the Xbox One X2 and <laughs> it's uh, games are 30 bucks digitally, but they're $60 in store. And then people are going to start going, well, why would I buy it physically? And that's perfect. That's the mindset you want people in if you're a game company. So you're like, okay, great. So people don't want to buy the games at 60 bucks. They're going to buy them on a digital level. And we're going to do season passes like Fortnite is doing and now PUBG. So people pay 30 bucks for a game. And then in six months or a year, they pay another 10 bucks for updated content. I think that's where the future is going to be in gaming. The problem is like, do you want to invest $400 into Fortnite? Right. So the question then, I guess, is do you think that, you know, 
Xbox has the world's most powerful gaming console, and then they're gonna, you know, they come up with, out with the Xbox One X2, as you said, that's a great name. I hope they, <laughs> I hope they go with the Xbox One X2, um, which is again the world's most powerful gaming console. Or, you know, let's say hypothetically, which I know they're saying it probably won't, but it, you know, plays everything at 4K 60 frames per second. Right. Or you can get the streaming thing that's less expensive, and your games are less expensive, but your internet's not good enough. And even if you have really good internet, getting 4K 60 is going to be pretty challenging. Yeah, it's, it's impossible. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, is it? Oh, is there going to be a segment of the population similar to how you know I watch my net my 4K 4K in quotes Netflix, and I have no problems with it. Like, I'm I'm fine with it. Like, I recognize that if I had the physical media the picture would probably be a little bit better. The sound would probably be a little bit better. Like, I get that. And there are some people who that is the only way they want to experience that media. Do you think there's enough of those people that the idea of having a streaming service that they can't down at least download the thing um, where they have to stream it, that it, they're not going to be able to get the absolute best picture, the absolute best sound, guaranteed 100% of the time, if they lose internet, they're out of luck. Like, are there going to be those people who are so staunch about that, that they'll still have that option for at least downloading or for physical media really far into the future here? I think downloading always has to be an option. Um, right now, no, none of that is feasible because it, if I put on Hulu, Scrubs is blurry for the first 15 seconds of it coming on. And that's, that is Wi-Fi. It's not hardwired. Um, obviously I get better, uh, connection and better picture for my 4k movies on Netflix because it's hardwired, but mm -hmm. people also don't even, depending on where your cable company puts your modem, some people can't even hardwire to their consoles. So when we, when you put all this stuff together, uh, you're I mean you're right. You can't the way technology is now. No, the way technology moves at the speed it's moving, I could see in two years being able to stream 4K better. Right, for sure. But and there are places that can do it now. Yes, there are places that run fiber optic that can do it way better than most places. We don't even my city. You can't even get fiber optic because there's a contract with our cable company that doesn't allow competitors in the city Yep, is insane. Um, so, you know, a lot of places are stuck like with stuff like that. And we had, our city has a 10 year contract that they keep renewing for 10 years. So, you know, a lot of places will never see that option. Um, so I don't, I think, okay. The perfect scenario for gaming is to be streaming, but, we can't attain that, I don't think. At least right. not anytime soon. So, final question before we go on to our listener questions of the week: what is what is the price point, and what does that price point need to include? If you know, and we'll use Microsoft because they have kind of some services that are built that way. If Microsoft comes out for their next version of their console, says, "All right, here's the console. It's however much money it is, which I'm sure probably matters." But your subscription cost then is X dollars a month. And with that, you basically get games with Golden Game Pass. And that is your streaming service. What does that X number need to be? Assuming, obviously, Game, pa game Pass could grow. It could train. It could do a ton of different things that would affect that. But if it stayed the service that it currently is with the 100-ish games, all first-party games, all that good stuff, like what is that price for you that you say, yes, I would do this no questions asked. So you're talking about for the console and the service or just the service? Just monthly service of like, yep, here's what I'm going to play, knowing that like, hey, I, you know, depending on how they create the box, depending on what memory is, you may or may not be able to download games. You may or may not be able to buy games. Like mm -hmm. if it was just purely a streaming box and you got Game Pass and you got Xbox Live Gold because you need that obviously to play multiplayer. Um <laughs> Those are the two things that come with it. And that would be the same for PlayStation 2, obviously. Yeah. Um, how much are you willing to pay a month? Knowing that all you're going to ever be able to do is stream games on it. What would you be able to pay? What would you pay? So, like, immediately I was thinking of, like, the Amazon Prime model. Like, mm -hmm. 100 bucks a year isn't... Okay. It, it, it's not crazy. But if we're removing the ability to download, like, Game Pass's biggest appeal over PS Now well, well, uh, PS downloading now. games. That's true. And uh, you can download PS Now does do that now, but they hadn't been doing it for most of its life right but you can now <laughs> you can now right um which makes ps now more appealing to people i would think except for the price unless we get it at your price uh um 
So I don't know. I think like 80 bucks a year if you're going to include Game Pass and in gold. Um, if you're only streaming, I would say 100 bucks if you're including downloading. So it's worth less than the price of two AAA games a year. At the point as, as in the place it is now, yes. I would say even so. though I mean, you're getting more than two AAA games a year in the service, it's worth less than that. Oh my Alexa's hearing me talk. Uh, I don't. I I'm basing it off of what Microsoft is valuing it at right now. So Microsoft is telling you right now, Game Pass is ten bucks a month. Right, so 120 you, bucks a year. Better if you buy it in three months, and better if you buy it on sale weeks. Sure, but you base price 120 it, bucks a year. You can get it for 60 bucks a year if you if you are smarter. On sales. Well, right, but I also got PlayStation Now for forty dollars, and you said that, that was too expensive. And you've been talking the whole time about how it's too expensive. So not you can't, you, you can't but say not what it, you paid. Not what you paid is too expensive. Right, but that's what I'm but saying. Yes, now is too expensive. Right, but what I'm saying is you can't say like, well, if you get it at your price, it's fine. I'm saying base price. If you're just going base subscription price, it's X. Like Netflix is X amount a month, right? Like, what is right. that? base x price that it can be right and that's why i said 80 dollars. you don't you don't think that's feasible i just think if you're i mean if you think of like if you look at this year alone and this is like and i'm not saying it's not feasible or doesn't work financially or that microsoft doesn't make money or anything like that like you got state of decay you got sea of thieves you got forza you know if you go buy those games that's 180 dollars. well state of decay was less so it'd be 160 dollars or whatever it would be because it was a 40 dollar game or 30 dollar game but like so you're saying the value of the service isn't even worth the value of the games that are on it. You no, know what I'm saying? That's a weird way to say that because the value of the service is because of the games that are on it. Right. Which you're saying is, is way higher than the games that are on it. But you're not giving it a financial value that's more than it. Right. Because they need to be accessible to the general. Like you're not getting a Forza Horizon 4 every month of Game Pass. Right. You may not even get one every year of Game Pass. We're just having a year where you got Sea of Thieves, and then you look at Sea of Thieves sales numbers, they still sold a ton. You look right. at State of Decay, they still sold a ton of games. Game Pass is clearly working for them, so why not offer, a, as you say, a less worthy value than the games that are on it? Like, it's a, it's an option that they give people to play games that they're not always going to play. So if someone plays a Forza Horizon 4, they would never play it, and then they go, I want to own this game, I buy it. Because I'm not going to subscribe to Game Pass next month, or if you're if you're getting people to pay for a year of Game Pass instead of a month, you're getting whatever costs you seem reasonable for that over a ten dollar a month period or a dollar for two months of Game Pass. When people jump on those crazy sales, like you're getting a consistent subscription base. Like Netflix charges twelve dollars a month. Do you think that the content isn't worth twelve dollars a month? And right, but, what I, what, you for? but the difference of what I'm saying is, though, is I cannot go by when they release um, Making a Murder Season 2 on October 13th. I can't go buy that in the store that day. Not right away, you can't. Right. So what I'm saying is, though, the con- like you could go buy the game in the store that day. To me, it's just amazing that you're saying, oh, I like if you would buy Forza and you would buy Sea of Thieves, let's say you would buy those two games. It's very interesting for me just to have someone say, oh, I wouldn't pay $10 a month to get to play those two games, but I would pay $120 to buy them separate. You know what I'm saying? No. Okay. I'm feeling attacked, Kyle. I'm not trying uh, to attack you. I'm not trying to I attack think, you. I, I just... think the Game Pass is, the value is also in the DLC where people are, so I didn't buy Forza 4. I would have bought it. Right. I would have spent $100 on the, on the full set, right? Right. Now I have a game that I'm getting in Game Pass, but I'm going to buy DLC for. Right. That they're getting that money for from no content. I'm just buying DLC from a game I don't own. So they're not even, oh, that's pure profit for them just because I have Game Pass. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's like, it's depending on how you look at, the, you know, they had to produce the DLC well, for you to purchase. But you know so. what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. They, I, but you don't know what they, what they did for the DLC could have been part of the game that they published in general like a yeah. lot of games do i'm just saying i feel like game pass is worth more than you're willing to pay for it that's what you i'm just saying said that. you should have just said 80 dollars is way too low josh 
that's just about, <laughs> that's why when you're like, oh, I'd pay, I'm like, man, I feel like you should be paying way more than that. <laughs> like, I feel like it's worth more than that. But that's why I was surprised. I was like, I was trying to get you to a roundabout way of being like, I think it's worth more than $80 a year. You were, you were trying in a roundabout way to get me to say I was wrong. Well, you just did. So we're, we're all set. <laughs> you could have just said, Josh, I think you're wrong. What would you really pay? <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, hey, that's our thoughts on the streaming future. Let us know. Hit us up at Board with VG on Twitter. Uh, let us know. Are you excited to just stream your games in the future? Are you done with buying physical media? Are you excited to just sit down with your phone or your PC and just start streaming stuff? Is that what you want? Let us know at Board with VG on Twitter. Hit us up at Facebook, facebook.com slash board with BG. Before we leave you today, we do have some emails slash listener questions. I don't know why I said emails because they're all on Twitter and Discord. But Josh, why don't you take us through these fantastic questions we have from the listeners? Sure. We do have a few listener questions and thoughts to cover. Remember, uh, you can hit us up at board with VG or the very uh, cobwebby board with VG at gmail.com. Uh, we do have, we will have an uh, exciting. Uh, announcement to talk about um, for a plaid hat game you may have heard about in the past the coming up as well, so keep that in mind. Uh, so first from at PSVG Kevin on our very popular Discord in reference to Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, uh, which Kevin just completed over the weekend. He was very excited. Um, have either of you completed the whole thing, and what did you think overall, and have you jumped in on the expansion yet? Um if you don't remember where I am, I am abstaining from this question. So this is all Kyle. <laughs> yes, I liked it a lot. Yes. So, <laughs> but yes, I finished the entire game. Really enjoyed it. Also played the expansion. Really enjoyed it. I think it's an easy recommendation. And even if you're not a huge Harry Potter fan, if you're just looking for a more entry-level deck builder, um, I really recommend it. I know Kevin said he thought the end got a little more challenging. I did not think that, but that is okay. I think the number of people you play with, I think definitely potentially makes the game more challenging the more players that you have. I feel like just in talking to people, so. Cool, okay. Sorry, Kevin, I, I don't want to tell you my experience yet. I do enjoy the game, though. Uh, from Splig at Dopalicious on Twitter, uh, Splig says, my wife's going to a newer board game cafe here in Tulsa before me. Did you mean shuffles? <laughs> Yeah, what games would you recommend for a girl? Oh, is that the name of the place? I Shuffles? think the name of the place is Shuffles, yeah. yeah we're out of context. <laughs> uh, what games would you recommend for a girl's night out with kid, without kids? Uh, bonus points for including your spouse's answers. Uh, he doesn't know party size, but he guessed six-ish, but any size works. <laughs> well, my wife did not. I added my wife on Twitter. She did not reply, so I don't know her answer. <laughs> um, if you're going to a... Uh, board game cafe and you have a varying game uh, group size i would say any social deduction game maybe hail hydra which has been popular um uh, spyfall is a game i really enjoy even like games like ultimate werewolf and secret hitler uh, avalon um Things like that, the resistance, those would be games I would recommend. I would be in the exact same boat, and I just didn't ask my wife because I'm a jerk, apparently. Uh, <laughs> but I would definitely recommend social deduction games, especially if it's like a girls' night out and they're going to be having some fun. Maybe they're having a drink or two. Like I think those fit really well with those relax, having a nice, fun night out. That and then maybe Sheriff of Nottingham would be, I think, mm -hmm. a good fit in there as well. So yeah, social deduction, uh, Sheriff of Nottingham, I think anything like that would be an excellent fit. Perfect. Okay. And then lastly, from Paul Calico at PCalico84 on Twitter, uh, not a video game related, but TV related. Uh, what do you all think of CW's Arrowverse Batwoman? And he shared a picture of Ruby Rose wearing the full Batwoman suit. And I think they nailed it. I think the suit looks incredible. Um, really like high like probably the better quality of all the suits in like the Arrowverse so far. And that's saying something because they do a pretty good job on all the costumes in that um series. Uh we'll see how it looks in motion. Right now we just have a picture. Um uh, but I'm a big fan of Ruby Rose and uh I think she's a great actress as well. So I'm I'm excited to see uh what she does with I'm assuming it's Barbara Gordon uh 
I don't know if they said her character's name yet. What do you yeah. think, Kyle? No, I thought it, I think they did a nice job. I think the suit looks great. I think, like you said, it'll fit really well into the other things they're doing there. Um, I do think, like you said as well, it is one of the better looking um, suits that they have. But it is always a little weird until you see it on television. Like when yeah. you see stills and when you see stills that they clear, very clearly have done to try to make it look as good as they can. Um, and I think maybe some of that happened because there were some pictures of um, the Flash's suit for this season that people got really bent out of shape about that were taken like very like casually, like not like people not understanding that photos were being taken and people are pretty upset about it. So um, yeah, I think it looks great. I'm excited to see how that goes and, and what they do with it. So awesome. Hey, thanks for the questions. We always appreciate them. And you can ask us questions about anything, games, the CW Arrowverse, whatever you want. We're happy <laughs> to answer them. And as we wrap up the show, we are going to move on to our well-rounded life. So as you know, you all know, this is clearly a gaming podcast. But we want to give you one recommendation, suggestion, thing we are into that is helping us live that well-rounded life. This will be something that is not game-related, uh, typically, uh, but it's just something that we're enjoying and is giving us a little bit of meaning. Josh, what would you recommend today for a well-rounded life? Another great question um, that we have every week now that I should be prepared for. <laughs> Do you want me to go first so you can think? No, I mean, uh, when I, I just try to think of, like, it's, it's tough to always give, like, advice out and, like, and things of that nature. That's why I usually just talk about things I like wa- that I like to watch on television or books I like to read or things like that. <laughs> yeah, um, I will say something that Luke Lurk was asking about, about audiobooks. Um, there's an audiobook series that I'm a really um, big fan of that they're actually adapting into a film. Um, it's called the Chaos Walking Trilogy. It's by Patrick Ness. Um, the first book is called The Knife of Never Letting Go. Um, I got this based off of a friend's recommendation um, because she knows I have a lot of time to listen to audiobooks. This was before I was listening to like every podcast under the sun. Um, So when I started listening, I didn't know it was a trilogy. She just told me the first book. Uh, It has it has um, the first book has one voice actor. The second book has two voice actors, and then the third book ends up having three different voice actors. So. Um, it, it was, it caught me off guard how much I enjoyed listening to it. And it's a, it's science fiction-y. Well, it's science fiction. Um, uh, without, I don't know. I mean, if you're interested at all to check it out, I would say do so because I don't want to spoil anything, but, um, the film is in production with, um, our very own Spider-Man playing the main lead. Um, yeah. Tom Holland's in it. Like Daisy Ridley's in it. Matt Daisy Ridley is in yeah, Daisy Ridley is playing the f- female lead character, mm-hmm. and Mads Mikkelsen is playing the villain. Right. Um, so it's already a great cast. I know they have some photos, like a couple of photos from the set, but um, there's a talking dog in the book, um, but he doesn't physically talk. He, he speaks to the main character um, telepathically, which was an interesting uh, story. Um, very good. Uh, something I don't... Like that was three books I pretty much finished in two weeks. And that's unheard of for me. Obviously, audiobooks help, um, but it's a, something I enjoyed so much that I will purchase the actual physical books to have in my collection as well. Yeah, the, the movie I've I knew it was a book series, but when they announced this movie, it's actually something I'm really um, looking forward to because the movie is directed by the same guy who did like Edge of Tomorrow and Jumper and Mr. and Mrs. Smith and all that good stuff. So hopefully. I mean, the pedigree is there for this to potentially be an excellent movie as well. So I hope it I hope it works out. So I'm going to have to read this book series now then before the movie comes out. I guess on it I shall be. <laughs> uh, my recommendation for you is another thing that is streaming. And we've talked a little bit about Amazon tonight. The show I'm going to recommend is on Amazon Prime. And that is Jack Ryan. If you have not watched the Jack Ryan series on Amazon Prime, I definitely recommend it. It is a very uh, fun, I shouldn't say fun, exciting, uh, energetic romp. Uh, you know, it's it's Jack Ryan. He works for the CIA. He's a CIA agent, and he's trying to prevent bad stuff from happening. I mean, it's very tropey in some of those things, but it does a decently good job, not a perfect job, I would argue, but a decently good job of showing potentially why people might not like the United States. And in a way that doesn't make us, it doesn't make people in the United States feel bad. It's not, you know, the whole, there's not a lot of guilt with it. It's just very matter of fact of like, hey, 
these are things that happen in the world, and this might be why some people don't like this all the time. So it's very interesting. John Krasinski is plays Jack Ryan, and he does a, an excellent job. Um, but yeah, they do a really nice job. The, there's some really well shot action scenes in it, especially for a television series. So I would definitely recommend check out Jack Ryan on Amazon Prime Streaming. Definitely a show worth your time. Josh, what do you say we wrap up this extra long episode this evening? Let's do it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Remember, you can find us on social media at Board with Fiji. Use the hashtag, hashtag Board with Fiji, facebook.com slash Board with Fiji, and of course, Board with Fiji at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at Josh Bones. Uh, why so serious? S I R R I U S on both Xbox and and PlayStation. What about you, Kyle? Well, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, PlayStation Network, Xbox Live, Board Game Geek, all at Psychocross, C Y C O C R O S S. If you have suggestions for future topics, be sure to reach out to us on the social media. Next week, like I said, we will be talking about Essen. So if you have questions about that, be sure to let us know because, like I said, we always want to talk about what you want to hear about. And remember, everyone, whether it be board games or video games, Never stop gaming.